This is going to be another episode of the Best Damn League show. It's not actually the end of the Best Damn League show. You have to remember, we'll get to the split in the episode. But obviously, LEC, the splits have finished, but we're now in this weird world where the three splits, we'll definitely get to this later because I actually think the way this is narrativized, the LEC is kind of a bit weird. They've had the three splits, winter, spring, summer, but then... Even though we crowned the champions, Worlds is actually based on like this next thing, which is the summer finals or season finals. By the way, they've even had the audacity to call it season after they call the first week of each split a season. But yep. we already complained about that enough on this no, show. No, but that's, we'll that's, that. that's the season. This is the season final. There you go. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> even though that is that in itself is like you're trying to break my mind. So you call it se season for the first part, then logically mm -hmm. the finals of that like split would but that's not the season finals though. Yeah. Don't get confused. What are you a fool? Why'd you be confused by that? So obviously we still got that to come, which if people remember has the six teams in. It has G2 BDS, Mad Lions XL on the upper bracket, and then it has Fnatic and SK in the lower bracket. But obviously we're gonna talk now about the summer split and the way that ended, and the fact that, well, let's just start at the top. No, actually, fuck it, we'll go, there's only three matches anyway, so we'll just go through the three matches, right? So, obviously, the first one was the Heretics versus... Um, Fnatic. Fnatic game, which... Did, did anyone actually really believe Heretics could win this game? Do you know what I mean? Like, I know people tried to bill it, because people tried to do this thing where, like... They wanted to say that Heretics, like, is good or, like, that it's fine that they placed where they did. But the problem I have with that is, like, I don't think they were a bad team at all. I actually think even finishing fourth is fine if you look at the way the team played in general. They were around that sort of a level. Maybe it's a slight overshoot for them. The problem I have is this. is like, I can't get past, like, the Evy angle. I can't. Like, when I watch this team, I'm like, like, I actually, in a four, it's like the same thing when we get to XL later with Peach Dom. It's like, it's not quite as bad, but I don't want to actually, like, give the team props because I think that player is so fucking whack slash doing nothing. In this case, Evie is actually just whack. Like, so, did anyone I mean, actually believe they could ever beat Fnatic? Like, Fnatic would have to play really bad for me to lose this. I, I think started to believe be in the win. second game that they could. Because, like, the first game, they essentially <laughs> stomped them. And the second game, they were just beating their ass in the early game. So I, I thought that, like, at that point, I'm like, damn, is, like, Fnatic just going to blow it all here? It just felt like they were choking out of their mind. There was no synergy between the lanes. Like, the jung enemy jungler's just getting a million ganks off. Um, there's this, like, weird obsession with Trundle right now in the LEC. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, I can understand it as a counterpick into Sejuani specifically. But people are playing it into Maokai, which I think is just a bad matchup. I think it's Maokai, you could just... Uh, take phase rush and you're fine in this matchup. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like when you're watching the series, it felt like Fnatic really got off to like a weird start. I think Trimby is just not really good on engaged supports. It, it seems like before he was better comparatively when, you know, it was like Nautilus Leona meta. When, when he's playing like Alistar, when he's playing um, Nautilus nowadays, it just doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel like he has that uh, power within the game. So, I, I thought Fnatic would win the series before the series, but during the series, it, it definitely felt winnable for Heretics. I mean, that's the problem with Fnatic in general, though. It's like, I have to say, mate, it's funny that they really did have a chance to go to the finals, this split, because even though they can be good, like, they have a mode they take into, don't they? They do look really good. But, like, they always feel a bit like a glass cannon, if you know what I mean. Like, they can just com they can completely crumble if you fuck them up. I mean, even the comps they were playing, like, dude, they were playing some pretty ballsy comps, like, later, without going too far later on. Like, against XL, they would just play all those fucking crazy port comps, like... And the, the problem with this team is I, I I actually think this is actually I have to we didn't mention this before, but I'll actually give props to like the Fnatic coach and stuff. They seem like they've done a pretty good job too. Yeah, I mean the, the coaching staff seems like it's it's done a fine job in certain like aspects. I think that their their drafts are built to enable the correct players on the team most of the time. So they have like Razork on some type of like enabler champion. And they put Humanoid as the carry, something that he's going to be relevant in. I, the anti-drafts weren't so much this, but I felt like they found a lot of their success by putting Humanoid on Jace, giving him agency within the game, give Noah agency within the game. I think that that's like a good a way that you can complement the coaching staff. I think when it comes to macro, it's still weird to watch Fnatic games. I mean, they ended up out macroing Heretics, but like Heretics just look off. And when you when they played against, for example, XL, it, it just didn't feel like Fnatic was able to compete with them like team wise. So I guess some aspects of the coaching look good. Um, and then other aspects of the way the team plays, I think you could criticize the coaching in terms of how they played the map. It feels like Fnatic is the team that 
this is what I always say about Razor. He'll make five good plays and then he'll make one catastrophic play that will erase everything else that he's done in the game. So he'll make five good plays and he'll have one play that, that's bad and it'll just erase everything. And Fnatic in general does this a lot. I mean, the, the series that they played versus, um, I believe it was, was it SK? It, it was either SK or, um, yeah, I think it might've been, it, it was either SK or uh, when they played against Mad Lions, but there was one play where they had killed over and over again. They, they had, you know, Razor is like 5-0 or something. They make a play top. Like, Humanoid makes a play top. He's resetting. And for some reason, the support in jungle, I think it was like Trundle Nautilus, tried to kill a Cassio mid. And they see no one on the map when they're doing this. They, there's there's no vision of anyone. And suddenly, all three members of the enemy team show up. You know, support jungle just come. They cover the Cassio. It's like such a, a, a high risk, like almost zero reward play to go for because you can't really kill a Cassio. And then the whole game just feels even slash losing. So... Uh, Fnatic is tough to watch in that respect because you don't feel like even when they have big leads, they're going to like close it out. Well, they kind of are the team that gets leads, throws, and then they like kind of end up winning sometimes like in a late game situation. The only thing is though, like in this actual series, the Heretics one, it did look, I want to get your take on this. Like, yeah, I, I Obviously, yes, Heretics did win the first game and they were doing well in the second game. Didn't that first game look a bit like, like that was almost like a troll draft from Fnatic, wasn't it? Like, what were they doing with that? Like, like they got it over, sorted out later and they had it nailed. Like, as far as I can tell, by the way, once Fnatic played the correct champions, Heretics just didn't have anything to do. They didn't even play any of the champions. They couldn't take anything away from them. But like, the first draft looks a bit sus, doesn't it? I, mean, there, I think there's aspects of it that 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 looks us. I think Zeri is is not it. I, I mean, Zeri is is really nerfed. Some people are still playing it. I mean, Ruler played it, and you know, while Ruler was playing it, Noah's actually tweeting out like he's like, "God damn, Ruler is so good." And I'm like, "Shit, is this motherfucker gonna play Zeri?" <laughs> like, it's, it's like that thing where Carrier just tricked all the Western supports and think they could play whatever they wanted. At well, yeah, they were like, like you, you ain't him, bro. You ain't him. You know? Yeah, I mean? it's like, please stop playing Callista <laughs> exactly. support. Like, yes. you've made your whole fucking career <laughs> playing like Nautilus and Leo. Yona, and you have the audacity to think that a no hand player like you could play fucking Callista. Like I, I couldn't believe that shit. Um, but yeah, Zeri is also Zeri is a champion that I just think is not that strong right now. People are trying to make it work with Static Shiv uh, because it was actually so OP before, and people have practiced a lot of Zeri, so they want to cool. be able to use that. Like if they've played it, if they think they played it at a really high level, they're trying to find ways for it to be viable. I just think it's unnecessary. I mean, Varus is stronger. I think if you want to play a nerf champion, you can play a Philios. Uh, you have Kaisa, which is really OP. Zaya is, re is really OP right now. I think you should just stick to those champions and, you know, let, you know, uh, let, let Zeri just die until they inevitably rebuff it for Worlds. Because the rest of the series, for me, once Fnatic just stabilized the draft, basically, like like I said, dude, it's, I don't even blame the actual coaching staff for Heretics. Like, the fact they could get there this far shows me they did something. They could never have won a best of five like this, mate. Like, you could see in the draft, they just out of options. Like, they can't take anything yeah. away from Fnatic. And they couldn't, like, there's only so many bands in the game. Like, the, like the, I don't think they could have done anything here, mate. Like, with the players they have, like, my main focus on the Heretic side is just if they can keep the core of the team and upgrade the team, then they could be good next year. That's that's basically all I have to say about Rex. Like, no diss. I've already done all the rants about Evie. He's just not a good player. I understand why they kept him over Ruby. If people don't know, that probably was even the right choice if you look at the lanes they play and how they were fucking the team. But you have to you have to just make upgrades if you're Rex. If you can keep Jankos, he's still under contract. If you can keep the core of this team and make an actual real top lane signing and maybe even support as well, this could actually be a good team. This could be like a this could this team could be in a final in the future. Yeah. I mean, the, the scary so? thing for me is, you know, they always say that you're always as good as your, you're only as good as your last game. And Evie's last games were actually like his best games all year. So is Heretics <laughs> just going to cope themselves into actually keeping this guy on the roster? They're like, oh man, like he, look, he was showing some improvement towards the end. Like maybe he could be good next year. Like I could, I could see an angle where they just, you know, provide me with content for another year. Just, you know, saying the obvious, like this guy is clearly not good. I mean, you know how doomed the game is when game four, you see Evie lock in Lilia. Everything that you've done the whole season relies on That's Evie mild. being the standout on Lilia of all champs, like a very spacing-based champion. Yeah. I knew it was fucking doomed when I saw that shit.
I'd so mental in it. By the way, as an aside, that's why if you're actually a Heretics fan, like you want them next year to just get a better player instead of Evy and being a good team, you should be glad they didn't make it to the fucking season finals. Like, that would actually be the worst thing because what you're talking about there, Dom, like, there's, like, I mean, the worst example ever in history, oh, it bagel. didn't happen because they made the super team, was you remember after the season eight one where the G2 team Ch- beat RNG? Sure, and would, I was did so they? scared they would just keep that bottle in, dude. I was so yep. scared because yep. you know, I, I get why the result would make like a pleb who doesn't know the game in a boardroom like keep those guys like but you just know like that's the best we could ever have done and we're never going to do that again so like i agree with you yeah. it's actually a good thing that they didn't make a run here like if they could have made it it could have made like the copium kick in whereas i would hope what happens now is you look at the pieces you have like you've got Jankos, you want to keep him happy Vethio actually looks pretty good again Flacken's all right like these are the pieces you build around you're not that far you're not that far away from being a good team mate. and it's like you need an import dude this this domestic top players you can take yeah, I mean, uh, 100%, 100%. There's the domestic top laners you could take. This is actually the time where there's like the most domestic top laners available. Think about sure. who you have available. Wonder, Alfari, Bwipo, that literally used to be top yeah. three best top laners in the entire LEC. Even if they're coming off breaks, when those guys will be able to plug and play and perform. Back. Yeah, come yeah. on. If you put all three of those in, one of them becomes like well, a top three top laner again, of course. I'll always take a chance on Wonder Man. Like with with the performance of that guy, I'll always take take a chance on him. Also, I was a little bit triggered. Here's something that, that you'll appreciate because you always really uh, you know like history. So there was a narrative after Odo made finals. Was he a better all time player than like Wonder and Soaz and all these guys with like this finals yeah. appearance? And to me, I just thought this was like one of the most like if you think about who Wonder was and like his peak was like he was actually beating Asian top leaders. Like he was beating the best top leaders in the world at his peak. And then you compare that to like the consistent, it's like Odo's been consistent. It's like he made it to finals and got 3 0 in like one of the weakest splits ever. Like I think Odo's a good player, but the idea that he like has now be like elevated himself to being over Odo Omne all the time, like I just can't even begin to fuck with this type of logic. No, the problem with that one basically is it's the number one trap I actually think when people do historical rankings, which is just longevity. I yeah. mean, the most obvious example right now is the LeBron James angle. Like, mm-hmm. spoiler guys, if you've watched basketball, LeBron playing three or four extra seasons didn't actually make him like twice as good at basketball. Like, he's actually not even that far. His level's even pretty much the same. But what people want to do is their brain just goes like, yeah, but he did it for longer. It's like, but here's my problem with that topic, right? Is look, obviously you can't just have like a one year wonder play. You have to have like a proper mm-hmm. career. Yes. But at the same time, whenever you talk about the, the greatest players of all time, there is an element to which you are saying at some point in their career, that player is the best player to ever play that position, that spot. So logically, yeah. that's why longevity alone can't do it because this argument's the perfect one, right, Dom? Because if we take the best ever Odo Amne, which to be fair to Odo Amne fans would probably be the season six one where he played some Jays carry and that it wasn't like mm-hmm. the weak side. But even if we take generally in his career, he's not better than like peak Soaz or Wonder, like you say. Like, yes. those Soaz and Wonder are the two. Reason they were like winning tournaments or in, in massive finals. Like the difference is, Odo Ande, what's always impressed me about his career is the flaw of his career. It's why he's such a good weak side player. Their play, their careers were about the fucking ceiling that we're talking about. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. Wonder especially was like, he actually might have been the best top player in the world, guys. That's not even yes. a fucking troll. Like, Soaz was more like in the era when you couldn't beat them, he could compete with them, he could do all the first pick shit. Like, no, I agree. Like, Peak Wonder probably is the best ever. Mate. Like, as, as in, if I have to take a player for one game you're taking him out you? you're not you're not yeah. taking Odo Amne in fact Odo Amne has got the same problem impact does because you know it's the overrate impact the same way Dom they go like oh but is he like the best top player it's like no but the problem with that player is he enables another player like if you're yeah. the best that you have to be you it's why when I do the NBA thing about LeBron the reason I always actually have a knock on LeBron is like you're the ones all telling me he passes all the time like in basketball at the end of the day he put the ball in the hoop like I want the player that does that so I agree I know what you mean I can see why it's like yeah, I, it's I, not I, a terrible bit of analysis like longevity does matter but if people make it number one it'll just fuck it up completely yeah no you can't have peak being uh, peak being less valuable than longevity like uh, obviously longevity if if somebody has a one-year peak and somebody is is another guy is good for 12 years obviously then there's a point when longevity yeah. can't overtake peak but if they're at all comparable like also if you think about the floor of wonders career i mean the worst place he ever had was like in this dog shit fanatic lineup you know, at the beginning of season that was just completely fucking doomed from the start where like he didn't even get to play the game. It's like a nine game split. And then if you look at like the rest of his career, I mean, he's always going to playoffs. He's always going to like, besides for that G2 year, I mean, he was pretty much always going to worlds. Like this guy was was mega consistent for a long time and he was always relevant. So yeah, I just thought that that was a, a weird point to me. Like, I, I just, 
I think that it's it's just people get so like wrapped up in the moment where it's like Odo has a pop off series and they're like, what's the nicest thing I can say about Odo? Because I'm like so happy with his performance. Like he's the best of all time. It's like, what the fuck? Like, where, like, where did this come from? Like, how, how do we get here? Which leads me into another thing that I wanted to talk about. We'll, we'll probably break this up because I did the the straight up talk with Monty about like, I think all the, the issues with like format of LEC this year. But here's, okay. here's an issue that I have that, that relates to this topic, which is now the fact that there are four split championships and how people are viewing split wins as the same as before, which I just don't, I, I don't think that makes sense. When you double the amount of split championships yes. you can win, like... How are we just adding LEC titles to like other yes. people's resumes? Like the thing that was so impressive about Caps is like dominant era is he won six championships over the course of of four years. I mean, it was three years actually, but like he won those six championships. He had to be like the best for years and years and years. Now you could win six championships in a year and a half. Yes. Like it, to, to me, I think it just doesn't compute that that we're pretending like these LEC splits are the same as old LEC splits. If you think about old LEC splits when he won his first title, I believe in, in 20, uh, 2018, when he won his first title, he's doing it in an arena. You know, like that was the the whole thing. You'd go, there would be a whole spectacle. There'd be 10,000 fans. Everyone would be there. It would be so hype. And then comparing that to like winning a split in an arena when you have like the more important split coming or the more important tournament coming up in three weeks, it just feels off to me that we're trying to like equate splits as one-to-one. -to, -one. to me, it's like, I wouldn't say it's worth like half a championship maybe it's a little bit more than that but i definitely don't think that it's worth like it's definitely not one to one to me like winning a, a split in season eight or season nine is significantly harder than winning one out of these four splits now well for sure i mean that is the problem is when people try to make it like as you say that they're all identical value and essentially now you just get more chances to win it doesn't make sense because like like essentially first of all you have to look at the whole accomplishment of the split like essentially they should sort of be like I mean, I don't know how you'd work out the math on it, but this should, this should be like, it should be a third of whatever the accomplishment domestically is of one year, as opposed to half. So that'd even be more fair. And then the other thing to me is, because the same thing actually happened in CSGO, and it wasn't until years later that I even thought of this myself. But in CSGO, if people don't know, when they first began, there was a couple of years where there used to be three majors a year. And then after that, they switched to two majors a year. And the problem is no one ever bothered thinking about what we're talking about here, Dom. So for example, like when like one of the teams that won three titles early on was for the Fnatic team. Well, that was when there was three in a year. Like, they won two in one year, for example, when there was, like, three. Whereas later, when the Australis team won the most, they won, like, four out of six or something mental with over a three-year <laughs> span. Well, well, think about Charter. Like, here's the other reason this is way harder. Because... In theory, the actual best thing for a team is to have as many championships in as short a span of time as possible. That way, one lineup, like you're saying, like the G2 lineup, for example, it's way easier to dominate for a year and get three titles than it is to be dominant for two whole years and get four. That's way harder to do the latter because think of all the metas you have to go through. Or you might even have to change your player or your opponents might change players. Like, I agree that the problem is we haven't figured out like what the ratio is. So, like, to me, logically, if we're going to count, like, say we make each of the pass splits worth one, then actually each one of these should probably be worth, like, three quarters of a split or something like that, you know? Yeah. And then if you win two, you get, like, one and a half. So, you know, something like that feels more reasonable. Because I'm with you, especially because... If you think it's bad now, me in like if we keep this format and we do it for like two or three years, it's actually going to really ruin it for people like the Soazes of the day that won the bunch of championships mm. years ago. Because there are going to be some fuckers like so, like some Mad Lions players going to have like five championships in two years. You know, like, that's too yeah. many. Because like you're saying, for people like Caps, like dude, to win like the six in a row, that was three whole years. He had to be dominant. Like that's really yeah, fucking be hard. the best. Like yeah, that's really be hard. Be insane, be insanely good for those years. So. It's an issue I have. Also, I guess the the season finals, which is the most important yeah, tournament, that doesn't count as well. Yeah, I guess it doesn't even count as a split. People are saying now, so it doesn't even count as a championship. But that's like by far that the most important, important thing one. to work. Yeah, yeah, that is the most important one. So yeah. like the whole value of everything seems like really off. I think it's because like the new format, people don't really know where to go um, with it. But just because something is called like oh you won summer split in in you know 2023, I just feel like there's. Yeah, there's just an issue with how people are perceiving it right now. I'm with you. I mean, like I said, especially as the years go on, that will get worse. Because, like, the other thing it also throws off is you can have all these people like my boy Oduamni until last year where they've had years where they haven't, like, won a title. And now yeah. people are going to rock up like, like fucking, like... 
Kazi's on three now by that logic. Yeah. He's, on, well, he's already on three. I don't think so. So then I, I agree. It's going to throw the rankings off. It's a problem. Yeah, uh, for, for sure. And then also, I, like the thing that that's also makes this, these splits easier is, I mean, obviously you take away the pressure of playing in like a huge studio and stuff like that, which I guess you could argue COVID had the same issues um, cool. at points. But the main thing that, that, that I would say uh, ends up being tough here is that like because you're only playing in two patches you're going to get way more upsets there's you're going to get a lot more just like one patch monsters where they figure out something on a patch and they're like their champions hit the meta in the right place and these teams end up, end up smurfing if you think about the consistency of teams like for years it was just like who are the good teams in europe it's just g2 mad lions rogue fanatic it was just all and then now like PDS is in a final, XL is in a final. Like you can yes. see these teams just getting close. Like yeah. Mad has a horrible regular season. They just get it together on a patch. They end up winning a championship. Like teams are getting to the their like positions, like these high ranking positions way easier because you don't have to be good for as long. It's not like you have to have a dominant regular season that goes over the course of like three or four patches. And then you get to playoffs and there's a playoffs patch and you have to play multiple best of fives. Like you can play two, be like for example, G2, they play two best of fives against the same team. Think about how easy it was for them to win this split compared to when they had to compared to when they had to play those fanatic lineups back in like 2019, 2020. They play XL, they have a horrible series, they still win. And then they play XL again in the finals. It's like, oh, we just played the same team twice. Those are the only two best of fives we played the whole split and we're just champions. That's why it was so weird to me that like of all the teams to complain, the idea that a team like Herex was the one complaining when CL came on the show is so weird to me, Don, because I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's better for his team, this format. Like, like as you saw, you can fuck around in some BO1s, get a bit lucky, you get a nice one. Then you go to groups, it's only BO3s. If you get a nice group, they had a half decent one, you've got a chance of getting out. Then you only have to play the BO5 once you get to the playoffs. Like, if instead we had this format, Dom, imagine the group stage is just all BO3s. Well, there's no universe where Herex is winning as many as they did there. Then imagine instead of like a groups into playoffs. It's like LCS. You just have a massive double limb best of five. Dude, they never get in the fucking fourth place. Like, there's no universe. Like, as you're saying, there's, even though I do like some aspects of the format, it does seem like, essentially, if you're the underdog on a heater, it's way easier to make a deep run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's definitely part of it. I mean, I guess the other thing that we talk, can talk about is, and, and this is an, an issue I had overall, was the, like, winning summer being almost irrelevant. Like you win it is summer, sure. it's so quick that you have the season thing right afterwards as well. Yeah, so you have the season thing afterwards, but like being first in summer doesn't guarantee you a world slot. I think that's, that's so crazy, weird, isn't it? Why doesn't you, you'd think that would just be the first slot given away and then the others would mm -hmm. come from the finals, right? Now, look, that's the that's where they fucked up the format. You're right, because they want the season finals no matter what to, that you have to play in it, right? So I guess yep. they're scared if you give some of the world spot, then people are like, who cares? You already qualified, but you're supposed to mm -hmm. want to still win the season finals. I guess they've actually fucked themselves and they sort of checkmate themselves. Yeah, and then because like when you compare it to winter and spring, both of those first places get get give you a ticket to msi like that gives yes. you entry to msi so those feel more important than this summer split where you know we went into the finals and i tweeted out before i had this like sarcastic tweet where i'm like oh this is really important for xl because if they win then they can get up to fourth place in the season finals but if they lose they'll be fourth place in season finals and then i said the same thing for g2 it, that's that really kills the hype for like the importance of the match like sure domestic titles matter but then you also so then you you go into the the whole rabbit hole of what is like a domestic title now compared to what it was before. But it just feels weird to like win this and actually not get any, you don't advance in any way towards your goal of going to worlds. I mean, every player has the dream of one day winning worlds. That should be like the huge, like payoff, you know, like that's where everyone is, is aiming their careers. And this doesn't advance you at all towards, you know, this goal. It seems seems strange to me that that summer season is like the least important one like it gives the most championship points but for teams that have already placed themselves like there's definitely worlds where xl and Fnatic that match doesn't matter anymore because you're playing with the second and third seed that have a bunch of championship points already and they're already guaranteed in season finals so there's worlds that even the second third like the third fourth that we ended up getting this time this could be one of the better scenarios there's definitely chances where you know all these best of fives could not even matter at the end of the day yeah, the other problem is they've made it as though, like, the thing you get from summer is, like, if you had have been in XL, if you'd have won, you'd have gotten to the season finals. But that's kind of a weird prize because 
It's supposed to be the best team. So you'd think like the best team should get some egg. What I would do is this. I would make it like you're saying. I would make first place and someone gets a world spot, but then maybe you just don't get like the seed, the seeds based on season finals or something. <laughs> I would make that maybe what you'd play for because it does, like put it this way, it's very unlikely to happen, but it would be stupid as fuck if G2 can now not qualify for Worlds. Yes. Like if they fuck up, that would be, they that can. Would actually, like, it can, but that would be so stupid for the, the way the format's gone. It's not going to happen. It? So people aren't going to see how bad yes. the format yes. is, but like, that's what I'm trying to like, Yes. Have people like realize that G2, number one, they're going to be playing on a different patch, right? It'll probably be 13, 14, 13, 15 that they end up playing on. They were good all year. Let's say they, that they really don't get this fucking patch. They lose two best of fives are done for the year. It's like, so they went to MSI. They were like competitive in every single split. Yep. They won two of the splits. Then they go into the season finals. It's like, oh, yeah, you lost the season finals. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we know that like SK, you know, they didn't make, they didn't win a best of five all year, but, you know, they, they, they beat you here, so now SK is going to, to Worlds over you. I think that's a crazy world that we live in. The problem they have, if you notice, when they make the format for, like, domestic splits in the West, is they they can only go between the two extremes. It, either nothing matters except at the very end, like back in Season 2, it's like this is just a qualifier at the end, and the last three or four teams make it. Or they do, like, the opposite, and then, like, they make the first split way too important or too many championship points. Like, they've got, what I don't get is why do they always have to go to the extremes? Like, you can tweak this a bit. You can just change the points a little bit and get it a little bit closer, because obviously we're laying out what we actually want here. We're not just complaining about the problems. The two things we want is this we do want results to count so like g2 is a great example if you have that many good placings you should probably automatically be at worlds at that point in time you know mm -hmm. like you've just done enough and then secondly we just I thought don't it was last year by yeah, the way what, what we don't want though is as extreme as it would have been with what was going to happen in the first split which is basically who was the team that the first split like overly helped mm, i think who? uh koi that was it. Yes, Koi, yes, Koi almost made it. If XL hadn't have yeah. won that third place match, Koi would have been the ones here, which just seemed like really skewed because obviously the first split was far away their best one. The second one was okay and this last one was irrelevant. So that just, to me, if I'm LEC, those are the two things I'm looking at. I want to make it so a G2 is definitely there and a Koi, it should be way harder for them. Like essentially, I would just flip the points for Summer, maybe like make Summer twice as much and fucking, I don't know, winter like a third of what it is now because the idea that like XL wasn't even going to make it, that seems a bit off, you know? Yeah. Like, you want to incentivize the team that's strong in summer as well. Look, if Koi had made, like, two finals, yeah, like I'm saying, like, the G2 angle, they'd be there, but they didn't even make a final, for fuck's sake. <laughs> how how, how yep. would they almost have been here if XL didn't literally win a best of five at the end? That seems a bit too much. That does seem yeah, too and let much. Yeah, uh, let me look back, but I'm pretty sure in that playoffs, like, Koi, yeah, Koi didn't win a best of five all year. No, no. They did not yeah. win one best of five all year. They didn't make the best of five in spring or summer. And in the winter season, they qualified to the upper bracket by winning best of threes. Yes. So they didn't win a best of five all year and they can just like, just make it in. They can just skirt their way into the season finals. So I think, yeah, that, this is another thing to talk about. I mean, I, I have a lot of angles on this. I think the championship points in general and what I've learned from talking to my community, because I obviously like stream and, you know, I'm talking to just people that are in, in chat like all day. The championship point system is overly confusing for the average fan. They right. don't know what the fuck they're watching. Like, if you're not doing these shows like us, like, think about yeah, the, we're doing these shows. And we're like, all right, remember, Thorin, to, like, yes. call this the season and, like, yes. the season final, but they're not correlated. And, like, if yeah. an average fan that's just trying to just watch some league, they don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, they see, like, the summer championship. And when I started streaming, so many people thought that that was actually, like, the final for, like, oh, like, they the winner of this gets first seed of the world. Yeah, like, top three seeds or whatever. They thought it was, like, the old days, basically. Yeah, they're like, oh, they won summer. Oh, wait, they right. won summer? Like, what? There's yes. another tournament? And then it's like, wait, why is the tournament not starting? It's starting in three weeks randomly? Like, well, how the fuck does that work out? And they're trying to put together, like, the championship point situation. I ended up having the tweet that everyone was referencing about how Vitality could qualify. Yes. Like, what the, the conditions were. But even going through all of this, it's just, like, way too much math for somebody who's just trying to, to watch the games. Like, they're looking at the XL game, so it's like, okay, so XL needs to beat Fnatic for Koi who got eighth to be sixth in the season finals. It's just, it's way too confusing of a format. Even if it does like make sense, which I don't even think it does, but even if it did make sense, I think it's way too confusing for the average viewer. It's just too it's, much for them to follow. It's why in general, I'm also not a fan of like round robins in groups where people are like, how many tie situations are there? What happens in this tiebreaker? Like that's so counterintuitive to a normal fan to watch. Like what you're talking about, the championship points. I know that it's not easy as a casual fan because I'm having to actively do work myself. Like what I do is the whole time for these playoffs, if you're a fan, I was just checking the championship 
points. Like, right, mm-hmm. they've got this many so far. I think this much. Yeah, you, yes. got the, you get like 50 points extra. But I have to say, that's annoying for me to do. And it's not something I would be able to do if I didn't know the way the format worked. So, And the problem they have on the broadcast is, if you notice, they actually often barely even talk about that. I don't think they figured out how to message it, basically. Because mm-hmm. it needs because to it be like a very so simple... Expli- I mean, it just is. Because the problem is, as yeah. soon as you give more than one possibility, I think people just get lost. Their eyes glaze over, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, mate, even though everyone keeps telling me everyone understands they don't, the amount of people who still see those graphics and say they've got a 94% chance of not making yeah. it, there was never a 94%. But anyway, that, that one just helped. That's always my pet peeve. Yeah. I can't yep. have that one. That one just sends me off the planet. Yeah, the, the, every match is not 50 50. <laughs> I try to explain it to people. They're like, no, it's 28%. And then, like, you know, Vitality didn't end up making it. They're like, see, it was 28%. See, it didn't happen. It was supposed to not happen. It's like, please, man, please. Like, oh, man, every. The, if people don't know, the actual sad thing is you're all going to think you're right about the championship sport because in the end, Vitality didn't make it. But that, they didn't make it because essentially we had insane amounts a of upsets. Miracle yeah, situation. Low, yeah. Every single possible upset that could fuck them happened, basically. And like, yes. at the end, all of them, all of them happened. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yep. yep. What a world. I think, I think that clears up like most of my rants, but I wanted to bring up all this because. Yeah. I mean, I guess the last point would be not having the only having one road show the entire year. And like, does that detract from the hype of the league? Because I feel like there's not a proper crescendo from group stage to like best of threes to the best of fives to the championship. It just feels like it's all in the studio. It's just you watch six weeks of LEC. You know, like when you think about an old title and, you know, you would be in this in, in a different city, the fans would be going crazy. EU crowds are normally like really um, excited to have LEC B or EU LCS B in their um, country. It, it feels like there's a lack of hype, like G2 versus XL. Like this was I mean, we'll, we can talk about the finals and actually what occurred within the finals. But I mean, most people, the, the general consensus was that that this was one of the most boring finals of all time. Oh, well, on the whole thing about not having like proper stadiums, I've got a couple of points on that. One, it is really sad because, for example, if people don't know, right now in CSGO, uh, I Am Cologne is going on, which is always held for the playoffs in the Lanxess Arena in Cologne, right? Which is like a proper like sort of sports stadium. And it can fit like 18,000 people. I think when they sell out for CSGO, because you because obviously for CS events, you have to like block off the back of the arena to put the big screen up. You can't have like max capacity. I think they get like 16,000 if they sell out, right? You would ask yourself, but wait a minute, they're in Germany. Why don't they just have their finals there? This is the downer, though. This is going to be some info people aren't going to want to know because it's sad. Basically, Dom, when I've looked into it, the reason why... You lose money. Loads of the, yeah, you just lose money running events, basically. Like, mm-hmm. when you do an event like that, two things that I might seem counterintuitive. One is you just don't make money doing it. And you're going to think as a fan, how can that be, though? Like, I'm paying all the money I'm for the tickets and the drinks. Like, you have to remember, a real sport doesn't work that way. Like, in a real sport or a concert, you go there for, like, three hours. Like... You, when you have a, a venue like this, you hold it's going to be like 10 hours or something. You're going to have that venue open and all the security staff. Then also, if you're going to like a Taylor Swift concert there, mate, you're going to pay like $500 a ticket. If you go to the eSports one, you're going to pay like $100 a ticket. You know what I mean? Like the prices mm-hmm. just don't make any sense. And so what I've heard basically is in most eSports, the actual big events like that, that's why if you notice now, the size tends to be more like 5,000 to 10,000 seater. It's more just like a PR thing at this point in time. You're just doing it to yeah. make like the sport look cool. It's not a moneymaker, believe it or not. So the sad yeah. thing is, that really sucks, I think, for is that competition. Not good enough? Because I, uh, I feel like I feel like that that is that is the way that you have to kind of view it. Is I mean, the whole idea of esports in general is kind of marketing for the game, right? Is. Like, isn't that just a, a way where you can market your game? Like, you don't... I mean, you're going to lose money. I don't know the degree. I mean, obviously, this is where, I mean, they're making the decision. Do you lose so much money doing it where it's not even worth, like, the reach or, like, how much people care? Because it will get more people. If you hold, like, I mean, they're holding one in France, right? If you get a French crowd or a Spanish crowd going, uh, or or even, like, when they had it back in Wembley, like, it, when you get a crowd like that going, it makes everything more hype. Like, people yeah. take that with them for years. People become fans of your game for years because of that experience. Like, is that actually just not worth the loss in money from running the event? The concern I have is just that right now, obviously, this is one of the worst years ever if people yeah. don't know in esports. I just think everyone's just tightening their belts. But the reason I think it sucks to bring it all mm-hmm. back, I'll even actually make the point I made about like Abadage, who basically is just a monster when he's not in a fucking actual crowd arena. Like, 
I don't want to have to say that about Abadagi. He's been in a fucking LEC summer finals now, Dom. I should be saying, like, right, he's past that. You know, it's like last year with Rogue. Mm-hmm. He went to a stadium, he fa- faced down the crowd, battled his demons, and he, he had... No, I can't say that. Like, the guy's just played a billion studio events. And I can tell you, in Counter-Strike especially, we really know this because, obviously, we have an open circuit with loads of events. Dude, there are literally players, no joke, who are, like, good players, and they're just, like, good in the group stage, went to tournament area, and they're, like, so they're not bad, but they're just half as good when they get in the big playoff game. Like, I think... It, like, he even just forget like the angle you're saying about like the market angle, just what it does to actually the competition. Like it makes the match so much more important. It means when you win, you are a legend. And when you lose, I'm not going to say like you're a loser, but you, you we can see that there's like an extra thing you have to overcome. You have to battle through choking or stage performance anxiety. Yeah. You know, I, I like that. I think that's actually, I, when I was younger, I hated it because I hate the idea. Like I have a favorite player and he chokes or whatever. Dude, when a player overcomes choking, it's one of the most satisfying moments ever in esports. Like that's why that rogue win last year was, dope. Like, they didn't just win. They beat the opponent that always used to beat them. They three-zipped them, and they did it in front of, like, a massive home crowd. Like, that was sick. Yeah. That was really memorable, yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, that that definitely is something that adds, and I can tell you as experience of a player, like, I got to play in, in a massive stadium before. When you play in the studio all the time, you become so insanely comfortable at the studio. Like, it stops becoming like a, shit, these are official games, and, like, you take in all the pressure. Like, the pressure just drops down to maybe, like, I mean, you'll still have some adrenaline, but it drops down to, like, I mean, I, I that I, like, in Season 5, I would consider myself, like, a mega veteran at that point. I've been playing competitions since Season 1, and, like, I would say, my like, the intensity that I felt was, like, a, like if Scrims is a zero, and, you know... Ooh, what the most hype thing possible, like a huge arena would be a 10. Well, it was like yeah. a two. Yeah, it was like a two. And when you go on like Madison Square Garden stage, like yes. that was like a solid like eight, nine, like you could feel like the, the fucking setup is buzzing. There's so much like energy, like people are so loud and there's so much like noise that like your table is like literally shaking. Like your desk is fucking shaking the platform that you're on because normally they build the stage. It's just a whole different type of vibe. I feel like that's the coolest part of being a, a, an esports competitor. Oh, for sure. I th- it's also the part where, like, it's actually why that whole thing during the time where we all had to go online for you know what, that was actually so whack. Because people kept trying to sell this angle of, like, but that's what makes esports unique, you know, we can still play the games online. But if, yeah. I don't know if you saw this, like, because obviously in Counter-Strike, everyone was literally online from home. There was no, like, LAN events where they were even in a studio, like, you couldn't even play that angle. Dude, it literally made the games half as interesting. I'm not even joking. It didn't matter how good the game was inside the server. Somehow, the fact that your brain knew it didn't really matter and it wasn't in a proper stadium. And everyone, the jokey Counter-Strike, was just sat there with that, their favorite coca-cola in their chair or whatever it actually ruined the games i'm not even joking somehow your expectation is built yeah. into how much you actually enjoy the event it's not just the raw like in the server shit believe it or not yeah i've never like actually i mean i've I played online tournaments like that just weren't that important but i've never played something that was supposed to be important online i, think but I can't imagine is. like part of when you have like if you have a really bad performance and it's on a stage and then you have to like see the fans after you have to do fan meets and like you feel like like that is just a whole part of the experience whereas now, if you like underperform, it's like, oh, wow, well, that sucks. You turn off your cam, you go like take a fucking yeah. shit. You like turn on like the TV five minutes later, you're in a completely different zone. You know, like it's just, it just feels so much different. No, by the way, that is even what people said. Like they said, like, for example, in Counter-Strike, I mean, it didn't end up happening. They canceled that particular major. But at one point in 2020, when we thought at the end of the year, it might all be over and might still be able to have the major. They were doing qualifiers for the major online DOM. So people were playing like a match that like means you don't get to the world championship. But then like you say, the second it finishes, you like turn off your monitor and you're still in your bedroom. Like, what the fuck was this? Like, so it did, it, to them, pros told me it didn't even feel like a real match. It was just like any match mm-hmm. on your PC. And then also, yeah, the other angle that just fucks you completely is then you've got that shit where it's like even if you win the match it doesn't mean anything like the people who won massive online tournaments back then don't where you won like two hundred thousand dollars and they said you'd win and it was the most pathetic feeling ever because you know if you'd won where it was a land you'd all go yeah. like party in the after you all just sit there like yay <laughs> over like fucking team speak yeah. like yeah i mean do you remember the champions <laughs> like do you remember, so, like, when C9, when C9 in 2020 yes. spring won the championship? And, like, hilarious, they just it? had, like, trophy. They, like, there's yeah. two trophies, one in each, like, and they didn't even actually have, like, a new trophy. They just took one of their old trophies. And, like, the manager, like, walks in in, like, a T-shirt and shorts. <laughs> and just, like, he just, like, holds it up. And they're all, like, holding it up. And they're like, oh, not too high. Like, the roof is right there. <laughs> and then they just have to, like, put it back down. It's like, so nice, wild. guys. We fucking, we did it. We're the best. All right. Like, it was so fucking weird to watch. 
I don't know, mate. I agree, though. We've got to, we've got to, uh, by the way, to bring it all back, I don't even care if it does cost more money. I just actually think, like I'm saying, I think it is essential to competition. Like, as much as I, as much as I don't want it to seem like that, I actually do think in a weird way, being able to perform on a big stage is essentially the ultimate level of esports competition. <laughs> like, the reason I have mad respect for all the people who've won worlds is like, mate, except for like maybe that one world where it wasn't as big a crowd, dude, to win worlds is like the fucking pressure is so bonkers in those finals. It's no wonder yeah. half the people who lose cry. Like, I get it. That, that is like the pinnacle of your whole career and you have to hold it all together even if you were the best all year like if you fuck it up then it's over like I, the sad thing is though I had to realise this I actually want that to be the case like what I had to learn was this you know when you see like Kerrier or back in season 7 Faker when they cry when they lose worlds right that seems really brutal but you have to realise the fact that that's so horrible for them unless you hate one True, also, but, yeah. but that's why for the guy who wins, though, it's so epic. Like, it actually is, like, you have to have both sides of the coin. Because if it wasn't mm -hmm. that big a deal to lose, it wouldn't be that big a deal to win. That's just the way it works. Agreed. The Best Damn League Show is brought to you in association with eSports Bet, the industry's leading crypto odds matrix. Now, you may well have heard in the past that they often run their classic first-time deposit bonus, 50% on up to 100 USDT match. But they also have ESC, which is the new name for DJT. It's their own token slash currency that you can use to make bets and predictions and which can be exchanged for USDT, as you can find out on the website, esportsbet.io. Now, with ESC, they have a bunch of promotions whereby you can just get some for free and just start playing with it. So basically, if you use our link in the description box to sign up to the site, then you can do the following. You can join the eSports Bet Discord for 10,000 ESC. So that's discord.gg slash eSports Bet. You can follow eSports Bet on Twitter at eSports Bet for 5,000 ESC. And you can follow eSports Bet.io on Instagram for 5,000 ESC also. After you've done any of these, go to eSports Bet via the customer support on the website or go message the mod mail in the discord say you did all those promotions they will credit your account with the currency now this is a limited time only offer though so if you've never done it before and you want to take advantage of it go ahead and do it now obviously this could also pair well with another classic first time deposit type bonus right which would be the risk-free first time bet where you just make a bet if you lose it you go to the discord message the mod mail say you lost and they'll credit your account up to 100 usdt of the stake check out esportsbet.io for more information Right. What about let's talk about the the XL fanatic one then? Because here's the saddest thing of all. This is exactly what I feared would happen, which is Fnatic was pretty good. Like, I mean, by the time they got it nailed down against like Heretics, it looked like they could easily win those matches. But like they needed to the problem with Fnatic is, like I say, their ceiling's really good, but they don't hear it that often, mate. They feel like actually once you give them enough matches, now I can see why they even they actually benefit from the B or ones, mate. Like this is yeah. not a bad team. It's certainly not a bad team, but it's not as good as I thought it was. I really, I think I overhyped them after the bigger ones. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they just looked like they were on. It felt like G two and Fnatic were on a different level from the other teams in the bigger ones. I think so. I thought about this afterwards because Fnatic, they succeeded in getting third. They they did a miracle, right? Like they were <laughs> one of the the worst teams in championship in championship points. They were one of the lowest ranked teams in the championship point. Uh, for season finals and they were able to actually make it to season finals so that's really big that's an accomplishment i think the thing for me that was um rough was the fact and and i could judge this based off the fan you know disappointment because of the weakness of this split like it really felt like this split was was wide open all the teams that were supposed to be good mad lions vitality like bds the teams from last split yep. that were you know top four all those teams that were top four ended up being shit. It really felt like this split was wide open and that Fnatic should be able to beat a team like XL. When you look at XL and their roster changes and compare it to Fnatic when they got Noah, I mean, on paper, Fnatic should just be a better team than XL. So it's even though it is like an accomplishment, it feels like a disappointment because you think that this was like one of your chances. This was a prime chance to actually, you know, go far and make another final. Also, the other thing that annoyed me a bit about this was, it's like I said, this is why the more I look at Fnatic, the more I actually do think I have to give credit to some of their staff. Because when I actually look at, when you put Fnatic just in a bunch of games against like, and not like XL's even stud players. Dude, even against XL, they have limited champion pools, these Fnatic players. Like, like, Really, is that the only time Humanoid can ever pull out Tristana at the bitter end when it's just over? Like, you, you don't play this shit, bro. Like, everyone else is loving that mid lane right now. Like, also, you were, like you said on the last episode, you were the LeBlanc guy. And now it's just <laughs> not a bit Dagestan and you were LeBlanc. Where's your champion, yeah. Humanoid? You know what I mean, mate? 
it feels weird to see humanoid just start a series and game one it's like okay he's playing annie game two oh we're gonna run it back like what what is he gonna play game two? Oh wait what the fuck we just decided we're going like jace in, in this comp where you, you were like enemy team is getting like trist and all this bullshit against you it just felt very weird to see like the progression of the series because uh like humanoids champion should be good right now i mean i think so i don't know what happened to like azir like azir is just not something that he plays anymore i don't know what happened to leblanc it just it's feels gonna like he's like all time so champion as well isn't it it's like his signature champ pretty much at this point in time yeah yeah i mean i feel like he has the opportunity to play the champions that he's good at right now and for some reason they've just like dropped everything that they're doing really well on before even though, by the way, this is also why people obviously overhyped the audio on there. I do think it was gangsters fuck that he did just consistently let Koi know essentially like suck my balls. Like I yeah, think it's yeah. actually funny as fuck because I do think that is one of the dumbest off season moves I've seen in years. Like I'll put it all together for people because I've done I've dropped the hints on the past ones. So if we put together all the info I got about Koi, it goes like this. So we know they got rid of Odo there and they actually wanted to get rid of him. It wasn't even on the table that he could come back, right? Mm. They got rid of Odo there, replaced him with fucking Shigenda which is a, just a whatever move at this point in time. Like, obvious downgrade overall. There was the odd game that looked decent. It didn't work out. Quite frankly, I don't get it. Also, by the way, I'm just going to say this right now. It's so mad that Shigenda did that like meme like this because every other time you ever see Shigenda on camera, he looks like a fucking, you know, one of those like beagle dogs with the big lights <laughs> on the eyes. He looks like a really nervous, like, it looks like a dog that's just about to be told to get off the fucking sofa, like, <laughs> he's just got these massive like, so everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about he always has that weird expression on his face like and then so there's that already that's just whack and then secondly you've got fucking what's his name you kill Tamalran that's the only player apparently can't ever be transferred I've said this yeah. story before they tried to move Larson for like three splits in a row they wanted Vethio they could have had Vethio right now for, for this year instead of Larson and then you get rid of Trimby and as I said they wanted to get Reckless Roll Swap like bro like <laughs> this point in time you're trying to hint this team like this GM it is crazy and so what have you ended up with at the end if you're coy like we said earlier, the only thing giving you a chance of even making this bullshit season final was how skewed the championship points are. Like, you haven't even done anything this split. You didn't win a single BO5. You never got close to a final. You were never even close to the best team. And by the way, here's the last fucking nail in the coffin for Koi. Bro, after all that, last night you had a pretty good year. Like, your best franchise player had a pretty good year, and you got nothing from it. Like, like I think, uh, look, Otto already had his own angle to say this from, but he's right. Like, the coin just fuck, fucked the whole year, mate. And even though it's not like Excel's much better, like, they're only, like, a little bit better as a team. Like, it, it does make, Edo Amnib did make them look silly, mate. Like, the fact that he could just eliminate them himself. That's pretty gangster. I've got to give him that one. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I like that from Odo. I'm always a fan of, of the shit-talking. To me, Koi, like, uh, there's something weird because I've never heard of a team needing so many roster changes because of internal issues. Like, that's what yes. will be the narrative all the time. It's like, oh, well, we had to get rid of Inspired because the players didn't like playing with Inspired because, you know, like, he had attitude issues. And the same thing happened with Odo. Then the same thing happened with Trimby. It's like, how is there so many attitude issues within this team? Like, uh, like I feel like at some point you have to find ways to work around people's personalities or let them vent in ways and find some type of solution to keep good players within the team. Because you look at the team now and it's like, would you rather have attitude issues or would you rather fucking lose? Like what? Like, because those are like your two options here. Put this position to you right now. Imagine I said right now, Dom, look, obviously G2 is one of these players, so I can't really get him. But imagine I could just make this lineup today for your LEC team. It's so Odoan there, Inspired, Larson, Hans Sammer and Trimby. Wouldn't I, like, win the league right now? Like, if you could get that original lineup from no. two years ago back, that's, like, <laughs> fucking one of the best yeah. rosters in the whole league. That's actually insane how much you've sort of downgraded over the years. You yeah. think about it, no one ever... Let's be real. Except Morons, no one ever actually thought Balron was a better jungler so than Inspired. So many people thought he was good, though. I don't think it was so did. crazy. To me, it was more like his style maybe just helped them in, at one point in time. So, like, it's so whack, isn't it? Because here's yeah. the reason why I'm bringing it up as well. Like, people have, are ignoring this. Dude, what's going to change this off-season? Like, let's be real. Koi's not going to Worlds, right? I would imagine Koi's actually just going to be like a mid-table team for the rest of time now, mate. Like, I can't see what they're going to change. Who are they going to get? What upgrades are they going to do? What big player are they going to make? I don't get it, mate. They just I, I, the team so as far here, as I can here's, tell. here's the angle. Here's the narrative right now. Here is that because El Yoya is friends with Ebai, and obviously Ebai is, is in okay. Koi, and Ebai is so fucking popular, right? Come on. El Yoya will, will, could potentially end up joining Koi. 
that could be the thing that that makes yeah. the team. And then you have it's just pure you just come up with this out of nowhere. Is this your no, theory no, no, craft? no, no. This is like something that like it's people are rumoring. Okay. Because I, I think Ebi, I, I, Ebi apparently move. tweeted some shit like he's like oh like like he's unhappy with the team publicly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, look, that would be a sexy move. That's. I mean, I can't. I don't know how the fuck, like you say, it has to be the Spanish angle. Why the fuck El Yoyo would be joining Koi? I have no idea, mate. Again, if I'm you, mate, I'm I'm already joining G2 or Fnatic, basically. It's got, I've got. I need the big offer. I'm not going to fucking Koi. <laughs> yeah. But then again, like if you're if you buddy up with like one of literally the most popular streamer in the entire world at this point, I guess like it may, maybe that's maybe that's the angle. Who knows? And to be fair, actually... if you play for Koi and you're literally in Abai's org and you're Spanish, you yeah. never ever have to be worried about being flamed ever again because you've got like an entire like defense yeah. unit of people who will just attack anyone who ever flames <laughs> you. Like it's never your fault, is it? The joke is, if you actually are Il Yoya, you should always demand there is a French player in your team. <laughs> just, just like a whipping boy, basically. Just make sure the whole team isn't Spanish. You're fucking safe. You can't even fail at that point. Yeah. Uh, that's actually really insane. Yeah, and <laughs> El, Yoya, El Yoya is free agent at the end of this year. His contract actually expires Ooh, this year. Okay. I mean, I will say so, he's, he's probably the worst fucking last split of his entire career, but he's, that's, I think he is. you have to realize he's like Vethio. He's going to bounce back. Like, yeah. players like that, it's just so obvious you double down on him or you take a chance. Oh, so you got to bring him. Vethio over into Koi so you can flame him if things go wrong. Perfect. Would be the move. Yeah. Then either way, <laughs> you flame one. Because by the way, it's yeah. on, that, on that topic, I'll tell you how I'll loop it all back in. I'll tell you a move that people, you know what everyone tries to talk when they win the championship, like they're a genius. No, 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 G2. Understand this, G2. You kicked Mickey X out of your team. You didn't want Mickey X in your yeah. org. You wanted Targamas instead of him, right? That was your genius move. Now, just because he went over to XL, did well, and then it turned out through our circuitous means, and by the way, I can tell you right now, it wasn't until off-season he even knew it was possible he could go back to G2. That wasn't on the table initially. Mate, that is one of the craziest pickups they managed to get back themselves, because I I agree with Monty. If you look over the whole year, I actually think Mickey X is the LEC yeah, player of the year. He's just the best yeah, player. Look at all the splits. Look at all the metas. Mate, this guy was just the best player in LEC. Like, and G2, they, they're lucky they got him back, mate. Like, the whole league is different if he's on a different team. If, imagine if he was still on XL. Like, look, they wouldn't have been a good team, but G2 wouldn't be as fucking strong. Like, part of that bot lane definitely is the Mickey X fact. It's not just Hans Sama yeah. playing better. I mean, Patrick Mickey X looked a lot better than Targamus Mickey X. Yep. Like we could say that. We literally see, saw them both play to, play uh, with the same guy. So, I mean, yeah, that that's definitely huge for, for G2 to get Mickey back. And he is MVP uh, of the year. If you look at every single split that he played, everyone else had some, like, off split. Like, Hans didn't look right in, in, in portions of summer um, and spring. You know, uh, BB had like rough LEC at the beginning that he had a good summer. Yike had a bad summer. Like Mickey was just consistently good the whole time. He had bad games here and there, but he was just like a beast in pretty much every meta. I mean, just think about how he started the year. He was playing Heimerdinger, like all these like really abusive lanes. Then he just completely swaps. By the end of the year, he's just on Braum and he's just the best Braum. He figures out this Emacs oh, thing before anything else. And he just brings Braum back into the meta like single handedly. It's huge. The only thing is, though, right, this is another angle where I also do hate where in history, uh, as you add championships, people just do that thing like, right, you're the best or whatever. Like, here's the thing, guys. If you thought Caps was the Western GOAT, then he was the Western GOAT before he won this title. And winning this title doesn't yeah. really change anything, does it? Because sure. to me, look, Caps actually did get a bit better as like this split went on. But I actually also do sort of agree with the take that like the craziest thing about G2 is think about MSI. At MSI, you were supposed to say, Dom, the only chance for G2 is if Caps has a pop-off game. Actually, right now, he still does look like one of the players that's going to be like a mild liability when you go internationally. Like, he's certainly good. Look, it's not like he's bad fucking players. He's still one of the best mid laners. But... He, he still isn't caps for me. He, he's just become a different player now, mate. Yeah, something looks off. I mean, it just... Even the way that the final started, right? You see the first play mid where Sejuani flashes on top of Abadage. Abadage flashes away, and then caps E flashes and misses it. It feels like he wild. would never miss that before, yeah. you know? It's like the guy, he, he would just hit that before. Like, he, I mean, or he just wouldn't go for it. It just feels like there's... I mean, there's just weird mistakes that caps makes that it didn't feel like he made before like obviously he made it when he was in the craps era like craps yeah, yeah. collapse era but when he was in that god mode 2019 2020 it felt like he was playing well so often and i mean even game three is getting solo killed as the blanc versus azir still ends up being fine he recovers the lane like whatever 
But I, like those mistakes just don't fly when you're playing against fucking Scout. That's the problem. Those 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 mistakes aren't gonna fly when you're playing against even your gal, and they're not gonna fly when you play against Knight. And that's who's coming up. So it's hard to like believe in G two as. I mean, I think they can maybe make it into the the round of eight at at Worlds. That's where Impossible. I think. I think that that's like where where I could see them realistically make it. I don't think they can make it to semifinals. I think it would have to be like miracle situation to make it to semifinals. No, I'm with you. Like that's the other that's the other thing that's kind of sad about LEC. It's not just the teams, but like bear in mind, like I said, the main competition for caps for real in mid lane probably is Larson and Koi's irrelevant. Like it actually means like that's why I, I gave you that angle on the caps thing. Of like oh, he's won another title. It's like this is one of the least important ones of the ones he's won for fuck's sake, guys. Like mm -hmm. the other ones. It's like when we were talking about that Bjergsen double lift thing from last year or whatever. Like. Bjergsen used to be the best player every time they won, guys. That's why he was the GOAT, mm -hmm. not number of titles. It's the fact that he was always the dominant reason why. Like, that used to be the case for Caps. Like, he used to be the stud. Whereas, like, to me, this is, like, one of the least important ones he's ever won based on his contribution. I mean, we just said the fucking support player was probably the best player. Then after that, what, like, Hans Sabre over the year, then probably, like, what, Broken player. The joke is Caps might actually be fourth or fifth most important player of the team. I'm not even hating by saying that. Like yeah, the rest think, of his team, that... By the way, the rest of his team's pretty fucking good now. Like, I even got to say this about the Ike guy. Better man, now he's had the full three splits. Now he <laughs> actually looks ready, mate. Now he actually looks like he could do some shit internationally. Like, he was a bit more green early and they were protecting him. Now he just plays proper jungle, mate. He just looks good. Yeah. I mean, he, he had a pretty bad uh, winner bracket final, I would say, for XL. I felt like he was, like, off in that series. But I think this final was, was solid from him. He played well the whole the whole time. And... G2 came into this final with so much more discipline than that winner bracket, which is what I was so triggered about, about before is I feel like G2 needs to look like they looked versus XL in this final to have a chance of being competitive. If they're having these like shit games where they're making just really weird mistakes, they're forcing all ins with scaling champions, they're just going to lose. Like you just don't get to do that versus better teams. You actually have to play the game properly. And in this final, they played properly. So I think that that's, you know, that's a credit to G2. That, that gives you some, some hope in them being able to like rise to the level of better competition. Here's the thing, Dom. I, I've actually now started to realize I'm sort of getting the streamer lifestyle now because I saw for a second in Twitch chat someone say something, Dom, and I almost got one guide, but then I've actually overcome it and I was able to just like reframe mentally and continue on because I saw someone in Twitch chat, Dom, actually said for real that Caps is not is better than BDD right now. Now, if people don't know, your that <laughs> take is so out of date. Like that's about a three-year-old out of date. Well, you're still thinking in 2020 world, you crazy. Less... Last year, maybe when BDD was on non shim, yeah. maybe that could well, pass. I'll give you, but if you don't know, BDD right now is very good again in the LCK. He's absolutely yes. a stud. And if you look at the champions he plays, two mid -laners this is you. his fucking area, you idiots. Like, these are all his champions are in the meta. Like, right now, I don't care what anyone says. BDD would smoke caps. Like, but you're not going to get me on that one. Here's the thing you're not going to get me hot and irritated with your stupid comments and make oh, it why? So, why for me to be able to enjoy the experience that I have to put up with that because metaphorically, I'm going to use the freeze pipe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my thoughts in that sense and I'm going to put them on freeze for a moment. A bit like if you have a freeze pipe, you can take the food safe glycerin chamber and then you can put it into that freezer section for about one hour, about the time it takes in this episode for me to idly check Twitch chat and then get one guide by someone. But I'm not going to get one guide by someone. I'm going to take out that freeze pipe chamber. It'll cool my smoke by over 200 degrees. Basically, like the 200 degrees of separation between you, parasocial losers, and me, your internet god who gives you all this content through twitch.tv. Not even Only on in a thorn ad do you get insulted. Yeah, exactly. Like, as you're watching yeah. the ad, it's like he's trying yeah. to sell you some shit oh. and he's claiming you. Yeah. Like, what the well, fuck? Here's the thing if you want to actually support me, not just be some idiot in Twitch chat, then you could buy a freeze pipe with 10% off code LFN <laughs> at thefreezepipe.com. You can also check out if you want twice the power and the power of water. I don't know, some related that to Captain Planet or some Pokemon, yeah. Bulbasaur, whatever. Basically, you go and check out, actually, it's Squirrel. You go and check out, obviously, the Twin Turbine Freeze Pipe. That's a pretty good one. It's, you can do it for everything. Dabs, Oil Rig, Bobbler, Bongs. They've got it all. Anyway, thanks to the Freeze Pipe. <laughs> 10 cent off, code LFN. Fuck you, give us money. That's pretty much, that's how we sum it up. <laughs> yeah, that's basically my motto, exactly. <laughs> okay, all right, perfect. Yeah. But here's the thing, you don't have to be a loser forever. We have an option where you pay us money and then we just stop calling you a loser. <laughs> Basically, it's sort of like internet content dominatrix. That's my, that's my sort of like side gig, basically. <laughs> like, oh, please, Darren, don't step on my nuts oh. again. Yeah, buy a freeze by now, bitch. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's irritating, isn't it? Tell you what wouldn't what be irritating. What the fuck has this show become? <laughs> Holy yeah. shit. Right, but anyway, let's you go. know there's only three series that were played. We went on like an abstract like format rant, and then now we're just going into like dominatrix like ad mode. I love to it. Let's talk about what the final law. Because the saddest thing is, oh man, this final this is the, one of the worst finals I've ever seen, mate. This was garbage. Like the everyone who was hyped about because this has been a real thing, because of the upper bracket final, it made you think, hey, maybe there's a world XL can mix it up and have a chance. Like this was shit, this final, mate. It was absolute garbage. Even they didn't look like they believed they could win any of these games yeah i mean they the thing is that like i said earlier g2 was just playing disciplined and when you look at that first game and they're playing i believe it was the kogma brahm again i mean they were just playing like some bot lane that that they needed to just play safe on let me just look it up to be sure that i have all the games straight but they're playing a disciplined game there's like four kills at 17 minutes yeah or this was the um this was the uh, Kaiserel, but they were playing a discipline game. There's like four kills in 17 minutes. They're outscaling. They're going to be stronger at a point. It just felt like they weren't giving XL the fights. And XL is not some like macro genius team. XL right now is a team where you feel like they're just in the zone together and they just believe in each other. So they see good opportunities and they trust like, oh, this guy wants to fight. All right, we'll fight together. We'll do our best in the fight. And, you know, the result will be positive because everyone's on board. They don't look like a team who can get into like the... All right, now it's even circumstance. Enemy teams got set up on Baron. They've got vision. How are we going to retake this area? When it starts becoming a complex game like that, it feels like XL has no chance. Even if they have Maokai, you know, Peach will find a way to fucking get caught and die. And there's going to be some issue. The play is going to break down and they're just going to get stomped. And yeah, I mean, G2 just wasn't giving them the amount of kills that XL needs in order to win these games. But I have to say, I actually will give props to the XL coach and stuff, because if people don't know, they brought that cast guy back who was in 100 Thieves with Abadagi, and then the, the other coach is that guy Hedon, who, if you go and look, was just in, like, nobody teams, like, just fucking, like, tier three European teams before. So, like, I actually do think, if you look at this team, like, I think this roster is, like, fairly limited. Like, I think the, the result they had here was even beyond what I thought was possible. They completely capped out to me. They plateaued. But they actually did consistently get this team with the drafts and how they used the players in a position where, like you're saying, they had a real style of play. Like they actually understood what they wanted to do macro wise from the draft through which lanes. Like it, it is a flawed team. Like, I, like spoiler, I'm not at all sad if this team wouldn't go to worlds. Like, yeah, I wouldn't really give a fuck. But they, in they a way, they saw them to go to worlds. <laughs> they don't, I don't because I don't think they can do anything. But if I look at the rest of the European teams, do they got a chance? Because actually, a team that understand how they play. You're right. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean. Uh... The the problem that I would say with, with XL is that when you have a team like this, they remind me of BDS last split that's just like vibing, but they don't actually have good fundamentals. There's going to be a point where either you have a bad week of scrims or, you know, you lose some games on stage and things start going worse. Like, how do you recover when you don't have the fundamentals, when you don't have that floor that you can fall back on? It's like, all right, guys, like things are not going great right now. Let's just go back to what, what we do well, like retake vision together. If you don't have those concepts down, I think it's really hard to have prolonged success. And they haven't showed me that they like understand the game on that level. They've just showed me that they are feeling it right now, so to speak. I've got a question for you. Let me phrase it this way, though. If someone's a casual fan, Tom, and they're just looking at like box scores or they saw the odd game of XL, they're going to say the following question, but it's a good question. If Peach isn't a good jungler, Dom, how did he make the finals of the split? Does it imply this, is jungle not as impactful a role? What's the angle? Well, I mean, I would say that this is probably one of the best metas to play jungle if you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Like, you're playing champions yeah. that literally have hacks. Like, Maokai breaks the game. You're playing Maokai. Before, you had to actually, like, understand vision. Now you can just be late to things and just throw saplings true. and bushes That's and true. retake, you know? Like, it's very easy to, to to play these types of champions. So, Juani is also, like, when you're playing these matchups, it's very hard to get exposed. If you were playing, you know, Vi Wukong in, in spring, that's different. Like, you can definitely shit on the enemy. Like, if you find a good engage, whole fight can be different. But when you're playing Maokai jungle, Sejuani jungle, like Amumu jungle, Rel jungle, like these types of fucking picks, it, it's it's not that hard to not lose your team the game. It, it's hard to, to int the whole game alone, I'll say. Like, and even when he makes mistakes, like you'll see him get caught. The thing is when you're playing a tank champion and you get caught. You'd play a lot of fucking Maokai and Sejuani this split as well. Yeah. 
Full kill. The thing is, if you're a tank champion and you get caught, half the time XL was kind of just using that as an engage. Yes. So like they're they're hitting Arsajwani, like they're using some cooldowns. Can we fight off this maybe? Like these mistakes are not getting exploited as hard as they could be in different metas. Now, if you're playing Lee Sin Elise Rek'Sai meta or you're playing Wukong Vi meta and you're making these mistakes and you like have to waste ult and flash to escape a fight, that could completely fuck the game. Maybe that's the engage your team needed that you that you know now is not possible because you lost your resources. I think right now he's getting covered up by the jungle meta. Right, what about... Um, right, obviously, it's going to be a few weeks before the actual season finals. So we will come back and we will do like a preview for that. I'll maybe get like a special guest or something that we can have so we can do some other angles. But just give me like the... What we'll do is this, because one thing I do like that we do on the show is we sort of keep, it gives like, people a timeline of where we're at. So obviously a lot could change from then. Like, first of all, is there any patch change before this final, Tom? I, I think it should be on, I, I don't know if, if they've announced, but it should be on 13.14 or 13.15. I don't think it will be 13.13 because uh, 13, patch, basically. well, 13.14 is already being played in LCS. So normally right. like this next tournament will be on the, the next patch. I'm not okay. sure which one it will be, 13.14 or 13.15, but it will be on one of the two. Is there any big changes coming up that might change like the balance of power of which teams do well at this season finals for you? 13.14 is actually pretty big. So one of the, the huge things is that like Aatrox is back in the meta. So when okay. you have Aatrox back in the meta, it, it enables a whole different type of top laners. Also, okay. because a lot of people are getting away with like blinding tanks and things like that, Aatrox is a, is a pick that kind of defines mm. the meta because Aatrox beats tanks and then the counter to Aatrox is like these really big carries. Fiora, Camille, like those were always the historic counters to this champion. So I think... That's interesting, seeing... Um, the sexiest thing about that, dude, is all the best top laners are basically in the season finals. Yeah. So so that's one. Um, IE is buffed. So you see, like, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what will happen with, with IE, but IE being buffed could bring back hyper carries. It could be enough for things okay. like Jinx to be played. Um, we've only seen... I've only seen two series on uh, the patch currently in, in LCS, but, you know, IE is being picked sometimes, so Infinity Edge being buffed. That could be another thing. This um, all seems good for Mad Lions, actually, so far. This sounds like some some shit they might like. Yeah, maybe maybe Mad Lions is just going to be better because of the <laughs> because of the meta. Would make sense, right? If you look at what's available. Yep. Might might even be half decent for BDS. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen fifteen patch notes. Now thirteen fifteen. Is this patch even out yet? I don't even think this patch is out yet. But I mean, I get if they do it on thirteen fifteen, which it would make sense because I think it's coming out like this week or something. I would have to look at what the changes are in 13.15. This, this patch is not, it's not even out on live, so I have no idea what that will look like. But I think Aatrox is, is nerfed slightly on that, but it's still viable. The thing I'm, the main storyline for me in the season finals is this, right? Because if you look at the teams there, like, look, it, it should be almost impossible for G2 not to qualify. So, like, most of the good teams are going to go. The team I'm looking at, Dom, is Mad Lions. Because if Mad Lions continues to fuck up and they end the year like this, I don't even care that they made the split final, then they won a split out of nowhere. Like, dude, like, you, you almost can't keep this roster if they fuck this up now. Like, they'll just be too, it'll be too much. They've lost so much. They've they've lost so many matches in a row now that it's, you know, I thought the turning point was going to be the best of threes. The fact that they continue to lose in best of threes, it's really tough to get behind this team. Also, I thought the meta was going to hit Mad Lions right in the face. Like, how did this not benefit Mad Lions when you have Hillisong on your team and you ended up in a Rel support meta? Yep. It's so crazy to me. Like, Braum is also one of Hilly's best champions, by the way. Like, that is something that he, I think it might be, be even his most played champion of all time, um, Braum. So, that champion being back, you know, Alistar, Rel, this type of meta, how did this not benefit Hilly more? I mean, the team just seems so off right now. Should have been, yeah, it should have been his idea. Yeah, if you look it up, not only is it his most played champion, Brom, dude, he has like a 60% win rate on it over his whole career. Yeah, and he played games. with some bad teams. No, exactly. He was in, he was in the fucking unicorns. You all. Yeah. The whack team. Yeah. Well, that's mental. Yeah, you look at his best champions, mate. Braum, Rakan, Alistair, Thresh, Pike. Bro, like this, you can play all this. Yeah. You can play all these champions right now. What the fuck? Every, every, also, the meta hit him right in the face and they still As we keep it. pointing out, like the joke is, of all the times ever when actually fucking the Kazi style of ADC should work, should be now. Like he actually has a fairly appropriate playing style. I don't get it, mate. Then again, Niski had a bit of an off split. El Yoya was fucking dog shit in the group stage. Like they had some really bad drop-offs. Chasey was always a fraud, let's be real. 
So <laughs> who's a fraud? He was. He yeah. Was. Yeah, it's tough. Also, like, Chasey, like, the champions that he was good at, you know, Jace, for example, Nar, like, the ability to get ahead inside, it became less useful. And in LEC, it seems like everyone's just playing, like, Ornn and shit now. So I think that's also uh, an issue for him. So, I mean, looking forward, Mad <laughs> Lions, they still, they still made up for Bracket. This is where I do fucking love fans because you can just tell when you read comments if someone actually watches Asian, Asian League of Legends or not. Because I saw comments that were like, holy shit, look at that humanoid Jace. It's like, bro, I, can I just take you to watch the LPL, please? Like, <laughs> should I show you what actual Jace domination is like? Like, these guys are just hitting shock blasts, motherfucker. The other guys are just like 1v5 in the team and like fucking switching between the armor form perfectly. Like, you don't know how yeah. cracked the really good Jace are, guys. Like, they're so unbelievably good. They're so good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's definitely a difference when you get into like a scout Jace, a knight Jace, your gauss Jace. I mean, they just play this champion so fucking well, and they've they've also they also were on that shit earlier this year. You know, yes, it felt like really, yeah. Asian leagues just understood that Jace was OP, and it took a while for NA and EU players to accept that Jace was actually a good mid laner. It felt like they thought it was cheesy at first. Oh, it's mega, mate. The problem is, like, as you can imagine, it's still a champion where if you fuck up, you will die. But if you, if that ever gets rolling, mate, it looks like one of the most strongest champions ever in League of Legends when those guys play it. Like, that is the champion, if you don't know, guys, where either you're going to, like, pentakill or get, like, 13 kills in a game. Like, it's outrageous how strong that is. That's another reason I do worry a little bit about the European teams. is because, mate, the best... Remember, the classic position from Europe is mid lane. Mid, go look at the mid laners in that season finals, Tom. Like, this is going to be brutal when the EU goes to Worlds. That's the position I'm so scared about the most. It's like, yep. where's all the great mid laners? Like, no joke. Like, like, let's assume Caps is going, right? So that one's out of the equation. <laughs> For real, we're looking at people like Knock, fucking Humanoid. Oh, okay. These might be the real players. Nisky. I mean, Niski's already had his own issues every now and then at Nashley anyway. Like, bro, this is pretty dire. This is pretty fucking rough. Like, Nook and Abidagi, I can't even... They're going to get torn up, mate. They're going to get brutalized at Worlds if they go. I mean, we've seen Abidagi get brutalized for years now at, at Worlds. You know, it's, ha it's happened consistently. <laughs> Nook, Nook will get absolutely... He will. ...booty blasted. At, at Worlds, we can't have this guy actually. Listen, guys, I'm going to give Nock the treatment I used to give TSM. Well, I'm going to do that clock alarm for when they roughly should get eliminated, just so I can be there for the tweet at that point in time. <laughs> I'm going to set time so I can be available. I don't care what time it is, Nock. Whenever you're going to tweet, in, suck my dick at him, like just right as he gets almost eliminated. Certainly, yeah, almost certainly. <laughs> And because this is my style, like, I also like when fans are annoying. So even though I could just, like, do a... What the, all you'd really do is this, Dom, to not get flamed as much, you just tweet back at him a screenshot of him saying, suck my dick. So it's obviously like he said it first. No, no, what I'll do is I'll just tweet, suck my dick, so that then loads of his fans who don't even know the drama are like, how dare you? That's so anyone who says that should be fired from their jobs. I love, I love that the most. Like, it's like if people yeah. don't know way back in the day when I did, like, a fake apology to Reggie and Wild Turtle once. Mm -hmm. I used that apology reginald had written in like a fucking twit longer and i just put all the names in differently and the best <laughs> part is loads of tsm fans didn't know what i was doing so they were all like this apology is obviously fake you should be fucking banned from each <laughs> it's like, you idiots that's what your guy said your guy did this <laughs> apology so by your own logic he should be kicked out of esports forever and spoiler that would be a pretty base take back there wouldn't it in 2014 that reginald should be kicked out of esports forever you know what you'd be right wouldn't you you'd be pretty prescient if you said that in 2014 it's 2023 the cunt's still here now still fucking doing shit i don't know what he's doing at this point in time like but... yeah also like what are what do people say like you should lose your job it's like what job do i have like oh. i like host stream like like what are they gonna kill I me mean, are they gonna ban me from that again i'll go back to live viewing like what the hell like what, what do you mean kick me like by the way, I'll give you a little side detail before we end. That is a detail that actually, because one thing I always tell Richard is, I tell him for real, he should actually write like a book on social media because he hasn't just like gone through it all. He's sort of like a guy who's very reflective and thinks about like what it says, about like humanity and stuff, you know. And his angle, I think, has nailed it because I, I guarantee this is why people have hated on you as hard as well, mate. He thinks the reason why people hate on me, it's not really things like I'm obnoxious. Right? What he thinks that people hate is what you're talking about, is that they sort of know in a way, at least now in our lives, we've 
one. Like, we don't have to work for some dickhead boss. We don't have some asshole guy like, hi, as part of the, you know, like, telecom family here, we're all going to be wet. And don't worry, on Fridays, we get to wear, like, a wacky shirt. But, you know, aside from that, I'm going to need you to come to the meet. Oh, I, I'm going to need you to do overtime. Like, we don't have that guy. And so, because we don't have that guy. And we can even sort of go ahead. that guy. <laughs> so, my dick. Oh, yeah, you all still love me. Yay, I'm still playing video game. They hate that. Yeah, like, they can't handle that. What they hate is, essentially, they can't handle it. They have to be that guy and eat a plate full of shit from their boss. But then I am just coming out like, yeah, all right, fuck everyone, everyone, everyone. Oh, just look at all the money. Brilliant. Yeah, like, that. they just want to punish us. That's why if we ever do anything wrong, they aren't just like, oh, yeah, that is a bit fucked up. They're all like, get it, take his job, take it all from them. Get it all. Like, they just want your whole life to be just torn apart instantly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, they did it, like, right, right then it's been twice. <laughs> That's still the worst one. Don't it's the fact that like you've actually done one of the worst things that in life in general. But like the yeah. fact you didn't say like, right, were you painting your nails? I was like, oh, what's he yeah. doing? <laughs> painting what's your nails in lane. I can't believe it. No, yep. <laughs> they made that sound like hate speech or something. Too. Like, yeah. just some kind of all painting your nails. Like, like you realize, like in him. 2012, people were like saying the n word with oh, impunity God. online. Like <laughs> that is where we came from. In 2020, I said painting your nails in lane, and I got canceled. Like it's so insane. That's even the thing I'm almost impressed by now. You know, in the modern day, if you report people, you sometimes do get like a thing at the end of the game. Like, yeah, we actually banned him for that. You're like, if you come from the early games of the league, you're like, what? He actually got banned? Like, like you're saying back then, the shit you could yeah. say was just wild. Like, the the chat log was just mental. There's a reason the whole tribunal was just chat logs essentially being passed. Like, it wasn't even what happened in the game. It was like, just look at the, what they said. And he just got banned for it back in the day. Yeah. Is what it is, man. Right, once I do works. this, um, obviously we'll be back in, in like two two weeks. We'll be back in just over a week, basically, because obviously we're going to do the week before. And then if people don't know, don't get confused by this, because I did almost get confused by it in the past, but I've learned from the LPL, thank you, to check this, which is if you go on Gamepedia, Gamepedia separates not by days or weeks. They separate by rounds. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. when there's an upper bracket, it will always look like, oh, there's just one game here. Like, no, if you look on the next round, that'll be like the upper and the lower bracket will be playing then. So basically, all that happens is once the season finals gets going, every week, there's like two matches, basically. So it's like two matches on like a weekend, two on a weekend, two on a week, and then we're done after like three weeks or something. So we will be back for the next one. We'll probably have a guest for that one, and we'll go deep as fuck on all the matchups.